you all for making it for the best theory at this conference. Yep. And it's obviously the ones for those with the most stamina, the most dedication. So please give ourselves a round of applause. A big thank you to everybody who made the conference happen. And at the end, we'd like to ask all of our colleagues here from UHI who've worked so hard and tirelessly throughout this whole week to come on stage as we have some special things to say. So please do get ready later on. And I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody who's joining us online. And everybody who's joined us here in the beautiful campus in Inverness for coming to OER 23. It's been a fantastic conference and you've all helped make it happen. So thank you very much for joining us. In case you need to make a rapid exit after this talk, here are some taxi numbers for you to um, book your travel if you need to. I love the taxi numbers in this city. They're all one digit, so it's either 1463, 222, 222, or 555, 555, or 611111. So, <laughs> hopefully, easy to remember, and please do let us know if you need help with transport. Now, we have a very special announcement, as there is a particular winner to announce here. So, please, a metaphorical drum roll. Winner of the Tim And there is an actual winner, but an actual thing, because we have you in person. Thank you. So I'm here you must be. The PhD supervisor is an Essex boy, so... Uh, <laughs> thank you. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and without further ado, I wanted to now hand over to the chairs of the session. Um, but also, I wanted to give you all encouragement to give them a warm welcome because these two wonderful people have been involved for weeks trying to mark those Scottish members and speakers and also those of us who are not from Scotland but interested in Scotland to be here to make an impact at the national Scottish level for open education policy. There have been free conference workshops, free conference meetings online, also lots of blogging as well. So this is not just a plenary, this is a whole lot more effort and heart that's going there. So please do give them a warm up. Yeah. Yeah. It's always up here at the front, being, you know, making sure everything runs smoothly along the plane, but we've actually created a man so uh, my name is Lorna Campbell um, and I currently work as a VR service manager at the University of Edinburgh. I've been there for about five or six years. I've been involved in open education since about 2008 um, and I'm very, very jovial. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about an initiative called Open Scotland um, and Joe will tell you a bit more about that. He'll give you a little bit of background about what Open Scotland is about. Um, and then we had a workshop on, I think it was a workshop um, about how open education is going to develop in the past 10 years. And Joe has synthesised some of the input analysis. So then what we're going to do is we're going to ask our panel to introduce themselves and to briefly say a few words about they see open education developing and in perhaps the next 10 years, what the challenges are in the own organisations and institutions. And then hopefully we'll have time to engage here as well and to get some feedback and to get some input from you. I know it's been an exhausting couple of days and I think we're just quite low at this stage, but so we'll try to keep things nice and simple and we'll be very informed as well. Uh, so I'm now going to hand over to Joan, who will hopefully say a little bit about so I'm Joe Wilson. I'm at the moment I'm head of digital skills in a big vocational college in Glasgow. Uh, I've done lots of other things. I've worked for, for, for public bodies and all kinds of things all around education. And actually, the beginnings of Open Scotland was actually an OER conference. Uh, here of us were down, down at the university, which made a auspicious place. Uh, and we heard of these open initiatives happening, and we realised that the Scottish government wasn't going to be smoking junior or consulted 
I can be louder now. I thought was, I thought I am quite loud anyway. They still they still can't get open, and and we need your help and this panel's help today to move the discussion on a wee bit further. It's like musical chairs. You can sit down now, Joe. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to invite our panel members to introduce themselves and to say a little bit about their experience of open education and what they think the affordances are. And I'm going to put Stuart on the spot and start in reverse order. Because also I know Stuart has to leave early, so just in case you need to run for it. Thanks, Lorna. Um, I'm Stuart Nicholl. I'm the head of uh, educational design and engagement at um, Edinburgh University. Um, I suppose in terms of uh, open education, we've been working um, in this space for, for a number of years at the university. We have a, an OER uh, policy that we um, had adopted in 2016. Um, it very much sits in the learning and teaching space rather than in the library space, because we want it to be very much about um, uh, embedded in the learning and teaching activities of the university. Um, we also have an OER service because the policy without action often gets forgotten about, which is, is why um, Lorna heads up that service and does a, a, a great job um, uh, embedding um, those practices in the university. I suppose in terms of Open Scotland, it is kind of quite disappointing. It's not had more, more traction at government level, but um, in terms of Edinburgh University, there's, there's a lot of support from that institution. And I guess partly, Lorna, you're... you're presence at Edinburgh University is a little bit about that um, and that was one of the early things that, that you did when you when you joined the university was to have some space to, to look at that. Um, I think in conversations that we've been having even at this conference it's probably it's more about the people it's about working hard at, at um, pushing the open agenda within institutions and beyond institutions um, and short of having that government level um, kind of movement and um, uh, that kind of government level policy and um, it, it's more about the institutions working together um, and and you know we just had a, a session just now where we talked about the sharing of policies between UHI and Edinburgh we adopted we kind of based ours on Leeds mm -hmm. policy and Glasgow Caledonian it's, it's kind of um, I think it's about the people it's about 
events like this coming together and having these conversations. Um, how many passes do you get? <laughs> That's that long. Hello, thanks. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Uh, Scott Connor, I am the Digital and Open Education Lead here at the University of the Highlands and Islands, so you've probably seen me around this week, and I feel like I've been put up here as a sacrificial lamb. Uh, somebody from the institution probably had to come here, and it happens to be me. So, But it is in my job title uh, to work in open education, and we've been working in this space probably since about 2016, when we were involved in the Open Education uh, Scotland project. Um, Keith was involved in that, Keith Smythe. Um, since then, we've been trying to adopt open education more in the institution. We've been doing that through uh, developing a learning teaching enhancement strategy, which has a value in it, which is directed right at open education and harnessing open education approaches. We've underpinned that with a framework for open education, which is a three-year plan, which has slid slightly due to COVID, but we do have a plan to enhance a lot of the work that we do in the institution to build capacity to deliver open education. Um, and underpinning that, uh, same as Stuart uh, has done at Edinburgh and Lorna, we have an open education resources policy, which again, we plagiarised from Edinburgh, from Leeds and from Glasgow Cali. So this policy is a truly collaborative policy now. And I think uh, you can take ours next time and you can give us some credit for the bits that we've added. Um, for me, I, I agree with Stuart. I think that, um, it has to be a sort of grassroots kind of thing where we all collaborate and build up together. But on the political spectrum, I'm a wee bit more to the right than the left. And there's a part of me that, that thinks that the adoption of the Open Education Declaration by the Scottish Government, and <coughs> I believe that the, the real impact can be done through a change in the funding mechanism. So how they fund, how we develop and what we develop. Because at the moment, one of the, one of the things that I hear coming up is what are the, the barriers, and the barriers are how much does it cost, we can't afford the staff, we can only afford the staff to do what we're doing. So I think if we can, uh, if we can get the declaration fully accepted by the government and the government to use that declaration uh, as a way to, to aid the funding, so to, to say you must, if you're creating resources using our funding, you must take those resources and push them back into the open space so that everybody can benefit from that. I think it's a, a two-end approach uh, on that. And I would, I would really, really like to see that declaration uh, adopted full on. In addition, I mean, the other, I'm not, I'm not going to hold this for much longer. I'm going to try and get it all out now, well I remember. In addition, I mean, we have, what I see is a lot of different, uh, like, policies and frameworks, uh, SDG4, UNESCO, UNESCO Paris 2012, 2019. But I don't actually see anywhere anything that says we must do it. There's nothing I see, see that says we must do it. You know, there must there is an absolute commitment. And if you don't do it, there are any repercussions. So the, the, the line of least resistance is what happens if I don't do it? Nothing's going to happen to you. Well, I'm not going to do it then. So thank you very much, Scott. Thank you. Um, I'm Robert Schuber. I'm from the Netherlands. And my uh, role is I'm uh, currently an independent researcher and consultant on OER. Um, well, actually, the situation in the Netherlands is, is a bit different from that from Scotland, uh, especially considering the involvement and the, uh, uh, and the interest of, of our government in, in this movement. And it started already in 2006, where they uh, were a, a big funder for the first OER project with us uh, in the Netherlands. And it uh, continued after that with, uh, with the Wikiwise platform, which was an uh, uh, initiative from the uh, from the government from the Ministry of Education uh, in 2008. Uh, the, the, in the the minister 2014 actually put in the strategic and the agenda the statement that in 2025 each teacher in higher education should share their learning materials. Uh, there came stimulation grants. There were uh, innovation programs. So I think we can consider our government a unicorn in that uh, in that sense because uh, it. it they, they supported it a lot and it made things, uh, now I won't say easy, but I think easier than in your place. Uh, uh, but still there's a lot to do because you, you asked me also to what, what has been done to be done in the future. And still there are uh, institutions lagging behind. Uh, the, the, you see now, I think everyone knows the, the, the case of the TU Delft, which is a, a front runner in, in, in our country. But there are also institutions, smaller institutions, uh, which, which 
are just about to start. And that is our biggest challenge in the, in the next coming years to, uh, to what, uh, as Rogers uh, says, cross the chasm. Cross the chasm from the early adopters and innovators to the early and late majority of teachers to, to, to adopt uh, the, 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 the principles of, uh, of, of openness in the in the education. And I think you should start uh, in, with, the, with the teachers and, uh, and, and, and um, connect to their passion, and that's teaching. And that's not sharing materials, but it's teaching. And uh, make, make uh, clear for them where their advantages lies in, the, uh, in becoming a better teacher. So. And I think it's particularly important to have um, you know, our colleagues from the Netherlands here because, uh, to hear your experiences because it was certainly a time when developments in the UK and the Netherlands were kind of in parallel in terms of yeah. government support for OER and just concern in particular and also we had a memorandum of understanding to work together. But just got are no longer operational in this area. The open education resources and open education is not a priority. Yeah. Just, you know, so. But it's I think it's still really important to how things happen. Yeah, and that, that, that and, and yeah, the, the colleagues of Sur have played an, uh, an important role in that and supporting the, the institutions with it and and, and, and uh, doing all kinds of stuff in in, in making. Uh, 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 plans, for instance, how to come to an OER policy, how to uh, come to quality model, and so step-by-step uh, -step plans. Which institutions can 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 follow. All, uh, of course, published CC by so so uh, so available for everyone. Although just coming along that, I see that old, very instrumental. Yeah. So, so pass on to my colleagues. Thank you very much for supporting the last ten years. Oh, thank you. I think there's two points that I wanted to make, which is that, you know, we're talking not just higher education. We're looking at openness in all parts of education and training, whether you're looking at schools, training, vocational education, FE, HE, research. And I think our government in the UK as a whole kind of looks at research, that's open access, so the open box is ticked. And I've tried over the last 10 years to work with those contacts that we have had within Scottish government, but also with the Department for Education based in Westminster. And very often there just wasn't a contact person at all. It was very often we don't have anybody responsible for open educational policy beyond open access and open uh, research funding. And I don't want to take away from the achievements we've had in open research and, and disseminating that more widely, but I think it doesn't really solve the problem. And I think the, the cause for us here in the UK is that we see openness as another challenge alongside, you know, Brexit, alongside the cost of living crisis, alongside climate change, sustainability, like the list of that is endless. And ultimately, openness is never at the top of the agenda. And I think our opportunity here is to present openness as a mode to solve some of the other challenges rather than as, as an add-on. And um, I read the Padlet and it's so ingrained in us that openness is the extra step that we're not going. Teachers need more time, more funding, more skills, rather than us thinking actually openness would solve a lot of the resource scarcity, would solve a lot of our training issues, would help small independent providers across sectors collaborate. Um, and that is something I think that we as a conference have been leading the way in for us here in the UK. So if there's anything I would like to see us doing is to show the open model as a way to solve these other challenges rather than being a standalone challenge. I think that's a very valid point, Maren. So thank you to our panel for putting their perspectives. And now it's over to you. What, what's your suggestion as to how we move forward from here? What are the affordances? What can we do? And what can we learn from you? Because you all have expertise. Um, in this field, I'm aware that we have got like a huge sort of cohort of GoGN uh, researchers here, and we need to learn from your research as well. And how do we translate that into practice? So, um, would anyone like to? Ah, Bill, go for it. And if you would like to introduce yourself as well. Hi, my name's Bill Johnston. Um, I'm a retired old person. <laughs> <laughs> Young and old person. Weren't you always an old person? <laughs> I uh, worked at Strathclyde University with uh, Sheila and Bill Cotsman. And then Tim. So you wouldn't know more Bill Cotsman. <laughs> My comment as follows. A lot of things I listened to here over the last few days and many, many other conversations about education, it's sectoral. 
and, and we're kind of always trying to sort out the intersectionality of ourselves uh, as institutions and kinds of institutions. Uh, and that's that's where we are. That's what evolved, and this is what we're trying to deal with. My kind of suggestion would be to start thinking about it rather slightly differently and taking rather than a sectional approach, take a whole population. Whole population is the uh, student body, if you like, uh, for open education. Mm -hmm. See what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would mean we'd be educating for all of our futures, not just for the folk who can afford to go to the posh schools, and not just for the folk who get shoved to one side into a second or third grade institution because the money's not there, the political will is missing. Mm -hmm. A starting point for our practical performance is this glance on the nature of the population. You can define Scotland on the map as a geographical entity. You can also define it in terms of its people by looking at its demographic data. It's quite readily available, and lots of people work on it and play with it in different ways. And if open educators haven't done that, maybe we should have a look at doing it. I'm teaming up with people who are already in. That's a very good So. Aging population really would be the one that would pull out the Scottish population. Uh, and, you know, we're getting older for like decades. Yeah. Uh, I was 40 now, I'd be shitting my pants. It's <laughs> 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 healthcare, it's old people's care mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. in the UK, and thinking that will be me in 30 years' time. Mm -hmm. uh, so something has to change. And so open education could be uh, a key to, yeah. uh, to open education. Absolutely. Does anyone on the panel want to respond to that? Nodding, Nodding vigorously, I think Edward, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have we got any other uh, input or comments? Or... Yeah, Vid. My name is Vid. I'm a PhD student from the University of Edinburgh. And I'm thinking there are so, so many points of intervention where you can try to make a difference. So for a parallel in a different domain, in the world of tech, we often talk about gender balance um, and we see this in workplaces, we see this in education, in many places. But one of the key points of intervention that I see as effective, a slow but sure way of going for it, is starting in primary school with our children about like, how they learn, what they learn, what role models they see. So since open education has a lot of element of culture, starting early is also important because you won't get people who are set in ways to change their ways. But rather, you can train a new generation of people to start with different ways. So I'm just wondering, what do you think about, like, where's an appropriate point to start? Yeah. Right, that's a good question. Um, I'll go back to something, actually, that, that Keith uh, was talking about the other day. And it's the fact that we, we have the General Teaching Council in Scotland. And within that old General Teaching Council programme, there isn't one mention of open practice within it. So that would be a place where I would think would be a logical place to start, is start with the teaching staff who are teaching these young children how to learn. That would be the log logical step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just really, really quickly, and it's just, it's just about the challenge, because we've had lots of conversations, and again, in Scotland, we've got some good things. We're not being... Scotland, there is a, there is a, a thing called GLOW, which is the Scottish Schools Intranet, uh, and again, if you're a college lecturer and things, you can actually get in and position things and do things in there. But but GDPR and the protection of children means it's quite hard to encourage. You know, we can chain the teachers, but they're always going to be for, to protect them. They're, they're always within this, this intranet so that, you know, people can't. So there's a wee challenge in some of that. I mean, again, it's probably more about safeguarding and training them how to manage their digital identities and all of these kind of things. And again, there's a kind of unacknowledged bit, I've seen it with my own kids, that a lot of these platforms say, you've got to be 16, you know, and my kids are all used from whenever they discovered these things that were all on, on, on these places, but the, the system doesn't really acknowledge that. They just protect them when they're at school. They don't look to see what they're doing in the playground or what, what, what they do at home. I can um, comment myself there as well. That was certainly, again, one of the conversations we had at the very <laughs> first Open Scotland Summit was how can we embed this idea of open practice and open education in teacher training. Um, and again, we've still not really cracked that, I think, but I, but I still think that that, I absolutely agree, it's critically important that we really need to develop this idea of openness and sharing knowledge 
with our children at the youngest age. And to do that, we need to upskill our teachers, but we haven't really found an in to do that yet. Surely, say that, surely as we said earlier, it's not just about higher education, it's Absolutely. about education all the way through. So the, log the logic, go back to what I said previously, was that you get that open education Scotland declaration through and it helps support education right from the bottom. Because, because they have, the Scottish Government, they have the input to the Scottish education. They could, they could change it. I think um, there's a question there in a minute, but I just wanted to say I think that really relates to the points that Dave and Rika made in their keynotes about that sort of paradigm shift that we are not really seeing at the policy level. Okay. Question at the back here just or a comment? an observation, the baby box has been a very important yes. aspect of discovery and learning for parents and for children, and perhaps even just a leaflet about open education rules. That That's a great idea, idea, actually. <laughs> get-go, that might be yeah. an idea. Uh -huh. that is a, and I think it's this idea that it's, and one of the things that can be a bit frustrating is Scotland has always had this very egalitarian tradition of education and you would think, you know, that, that you know, the principles of openness fit so well with the whole idea of education in Scotland, right from school all the way up, and it has been quite frustrating we've not been able to sort of introduce it at that level, so that's actually a very good idea. Have we got any more comments or suggestions or input? Martin? Hi, um, I'm not sure I believe what I'm going to say, but I'm going to channel my inner Jim Groom, which is always dangerous thing That's, to do. But maybe we've we just stand been back. trying too hard. Stop trying to come up with policy and stuff. Why don't we just have fun doing the stuff, you know, sharing what we like to do, demonstrating open practice. And I think that's often quite powerful then. It's like people say, how comes that person's getting all the keynote invites? It's because they've got a great blog and this person has been sharing this stuff you know, or sharing bits of your course. And, or just demonstrate so doing what you can at the kind of small level, the kind of small OER rather than always trying to go with the big OER. And then I think people think, okay, I wouldn't mind it. So I'm not sure I believe that's the mm. way, but I think we tried the other way. Let's try the yeah. fuck of us going to have fun kind of way, you know, aside from doing that instead. We've got another comment yeah, or anything sort of, there. So sort of backing this that idea, I think I do kind of subscribe to it. And um it's it's that the strength is the grassroots. Mm -hmm. As soon as it gets sucked into towards big politics, it gets watered down. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's when there's things happen. You know, mm -hmm. and sharing it in small ways makes makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's very much what we have been doing, and sort of like given that you know we haven't quite given up on trying to change or to influence policy at national level, but I think we've been a lot more successful at influencing policy at institutional and partner level. Do you want to respond to me on the meeting? No, I'm just I'm going to reflect on. So I've done all this openness and done all these other jobs, and then I arrive in a in a really fantastic college, and, and I'm busy pushing things out openly. And at the moment, every six months, I have a head to head with the college's marketing team. Because the college's marketing team doesn't, doesn't understand, they want everything on their website, but they don't want all of this stuff about lecture development and things. And they don't really want me to have my own Google site doing all these things. They don't have any, they don't have any concept about openness. Now, I know what I'm doing, and I know it's the right thing to do, but if I'm getting shut down at institutional level for doing the right stuff, I wonder, and that's why that column about what next and influencing policy at institutional level. Uh, there's lots of people when I tell them the Open Scotland story, they say, great, I'd love to do that. But, uh, and it's even more extreme if you're a teacher in a local authority, uh, where the local authority says, you're not, you're, you're not allowed to publish anything or push anything out, you know? Um, yeah, just reflecting on what you said there, Joe, and also what Martin said behind me there. Um, I have been doing work directly with a government ministry in another country recently and yeah they, they will not tell the universities to do things because the immediate answer is well there's money for it um but beyond that i think we have to think really carefully about your point Joe. what comes with government policy what money might come with it or what else comes with it do you really want some people you just named joe to be in charge of implementing like who because you see some control when it goes to that level, at a grassroots level today, um, we have control of it and we can shape it and we can manage it. I know it's I know it's hard work and I know it's pushing upwards, but I do think that there is a danger 
when it comes from the other direction that we lose something in that um, and that it gets co-opted by people we may not want to do. So I, I think there's, a, there's an interesting thing. Okay, I'm going to pass on to Robert. She was not going to yes, Because I want to, to uh, respond to that. Yeah, I see this danger. I haven't seen this happen in the Netherlands. Uh, they, they, uh, so, so, but I, I, I think it is a balance. Uh, and and uh, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, and uh, if I uh, gave the impression that uh, all the activities were only in higher education, it's not the WikiWise platform, but for all uh, educational sectors, and, and especially primary and secondary education have adopted it, and vocational education also. So, so the. The, the, the support is for all levels. Uh, for me, most visible was, was higher education. And uh, there is a lot of autonomy in those institutions. And not only in higher education, but also in vocational and primary education, secondary education. So they, they are very reluctant. Uh, and actually, the government is very reluctant also. They stimulate, they, they provide a lot of money, but they are not prescribing things. On one exception, and that was the, the exception in 2014, where the, there came a law that in 2020 is all uh, results of research should be uh, uh, published uh, uh, open access. That's the only uh, uh, law they have, they have made. And that really helped this movement a lot uh, in, the, in, the open, uh, in the open science uh, movement. I like that section, which is stim stimulation of prescription. Compliance would be correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sheila. Sheila was actually involved right in the sort of setting up of Open Scotland. So I think it goes back to, I don't, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to say here, but bear with me. A comment than a question. Yeah, well, it's more a comment. So I think it goes back to something that Dave was saying today about trust. I think we have to trust ourselves. And I think we have to ask why our readers don't trust us and what we're telling them. And I think we're seeing a slow change that we are getting more people in the predictions to understand about that. But I think we have a wider political problem in that we need to in education. Don't really know very much about education. That's a very valid point. So you have new minister. I mean, in Scotland, we have a new education minister. And really, his priority is not to education. It's going to be, we've got a big problem with the exams, with school exams, which have always going to be the driver. So I think it's how, how we can um, continue to trust ourselves. I think this is a fantastic community. We're doing all the grassroots work. There are people, lots of people in this room. We are making a big difference. Um, and it goes back to what Marion is about. <coughs> open is not just about open education. It's about sustainability. It's about all the agendas that are coming up. I think it's how we can continue to feed up messages saying, here's a solution. This is how you how we can do it. And it's maybe, maybe because we all, in this we've got a very safe community here, we can have a bit of a moan, but maybe we actually need to get a bit more aggressive and say, right, come on, let's just, let's try, let's try and not talk it. Maybe we do need some other, I don't know whether it's a paper or something, or we just take out an advert in a paper, I, I don't know, but uh, there, there's a, but I think it's about trust, it's how we develop the, the senior management to trust what we're seeing, and that's always a problem because actually, you know, we care about teaching. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to fit, draw to a close. I'll give Robert the last word. Yes, uh, adding to that, uh, did you also involve students in the Netherlands? And in one time, student unions were uh, uh, directly contacting the minister, and that uh, led to, uh, to to this statement. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with some other things, also the statement about this uh, sharing in twenty twenty five. And the students were actually one of the drivers for the OER policy in Edinburgh as well. Thank you so much for all your input. I'm afraid we're going to have to draw this discussion to a close now. We have, I think, five minutes on the nail before the end of the conference. So I'd like to thank our panel, to thank Maren and Robert and Scott and Stuart. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much to all of our speakers here for the plenary. Um, we are very close to drawing a close to this conference. And while I just give some last thanks, I'd like to ask all of our UHI colleagues, yes, all of you, to please come on stage because you're going to take a very well-deserved bow and get the final thanks. So please all come on stage and join us. So please, Keith, lead your team, all your colleagues. Please do come up.
yeah, but, um, thanks, Marin. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, uh, for coming in from this. Uh, we are 23. Thank you, Marin, and colleagues, for bringing it here. Um, it's a bit of a but uh, we appreciate it. Things have been great a couple of days. Um, I do just want to say a few thanks, if that's all right. There's a number yeah. of colleagues that have been behind the scenes helping. I don't want to miss anyone out. So I want to thank Leanne and Rory, um, who have been on the screen. These pictures you've seen uh, on the screen have been behind the scenes kind of helping cause all the sessions that were being recorded. Uh, Martin and Tom from HI and Burness uh, for hosting and bringing on all the technical support. That's been fantastic. But John, Carolyn, Scott, and Fiona have been um, uh, famously uh, facilitating running around, also something presenting. Uh, Anna Wendy uh, as her keynote. Big chat, thanks, Anna Wendy. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, some work very closely with UHI, Tim, a photographer who's been all over the place for that. <laughs> I would like to give a special mention to um, Debbie and Jane, who aren't here just now, who were on registration yes. desk and also set up the uh, reception for last night. Okay. Okay. So, you guys can go sit down if you like, probably. <laughs> um, uh, okay, sorry. So, one, one other thing to say, um, uh, which is regarding Marin, actually. Um, so many of you will know that Marin is coming to the end of what can only be described as a stellar and transformational stint as the chief exec of ALT. Uh, come the September conference, uh, you will not be able to say uh, an appropriate and fitting send-off. But for now, we want to acknowledge all the work you've done uh, in putting and taking forward uh, the open agenda. Um, uh, for us, you know, both within the UK and, and beyond, all the work you've done for the OER conference, this will be your last conference at OER conference as Chief Exec of Alt. Um, so on behalf of previous conferences, this conference and GoGN Network, uh, I'd like to extend all of our thanks to you. So thank you, Byron. Safe travels. Thank you for joining us. And if you don't know this spot of saying, you kick up, paste you back. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. And yeah, safe travels from us. I did have one final call to action, particularly as we're talking about putting OER into action, which is that if you would like to follow in the big footsteps that Keith and the GoGN team have set here this year, we are going to shortly announce the call for coaches and our venue for next year. So if you're feeling like there is a lot of fun missing in your life and you want us to descend upon your institution or you want to host next year, you want to become involved, our call will open shortly. And we hope very much that many of you will make it to next year. So from us all here, thank you very much for joining us. This is the end for this year.